So welcome everyone to the second of two Steenbach lectures presented by Ron Vale. And I will just say that Ron has been a, it's been really wonderful to have him visit here. And I hope that uh, everyone has enjoyed having a chance to talk with him. He's about to head out of town right after his talk. So I'm just going to say thank you, Ron, for visiting us. And I look forward to your presentation. Great. Well, thank you. I've had a really fun time here. It wasn't as cold this morning as I hoped for, but uh, uh, anyway, uh, it's been a great pleasure. I really enjoyed uh, um, talking to the students and all the wonderful faculty here, so it's been a very fun visit for me. Um, so today, uh, I'm going to talk about a very different subject. Uh, that we're working on in the lab, although I will try to maybe illustrate a few similarities. So the um, general topic of this talk is um, efforts to uh, reconstitute uh, elements of the T-cell signaling system. And I'll explain to you what I mean by that. Um, but maybe I'll just start off with there's just a word of what reconstitution is. Uh, so reconstitution has had a, a very important role, I would say, in kind of the history of uh, biochemistry, biological research uh, in the 20th century. And the paradigm goes something like this, that you know, we should always start with cells uh, because that's what we're trying to understand. And uh, you know, it starts off by examining cells and defining some phenomena that may occur in a cell. And then the goal of reconstitution is to recapitulate uh, that phenomena using a defined set of components, often in an in vitro setting. And of course, if you go through the textbook, you realize that a lot of the textbook, our understanding that's in textbooks, has been derived from reconstitution experiments. So uh, DNA replication. Um, the enzyme DNA polymerase uh, you know, was discovered through in vitro reactions by Arthur Kornberg, uh, transcription, <clears throat> uh, vesicle trafficking. Well, that was uh, uh, this past year's Nobel Prize was awarded for essentially for, you know, well, a combination of genetics and reconstitution, ubiquitination. Um, and I mean, I, I guess the one thing that is similar, which has drove our interest in, in doing this in T cells was, you know, of course, that it's also been very powerful for motility, the fact that you can take this phenomena of biological motility and uh, recapitulate it in a test tube with, you know, a defined motor protein, uh, defined substrate, and a plastic bead um, was really essential for being able to dissect uh, the mechanism of, of motion. So the question is, can one use the same strategy for something that is uh, as complicated as T-cell signaling, um, which certainly has a, a very uh, cellular component of not just a phenomena occurring in one cell, but actually involves interaction between um, uh, two cells. So this just shows a image of what's going on in your lymph node when um, T cells, which are here in red, are interacting um, with these antigen presenting cells. And these antigen presenting cells are collecting uh, um, various uh, uh, peptides. Um, and in case of if you're infected by um, bacteria or virus or et cetera, some of these uh, foreign antigens get presented on the antigen presenting cell. And if the uh, T cell uh, interrogates the cell and it has a T cell receptor. And remember, the T cell receptor has an enormous gene genetic uh, diversity. So there are many different um, uh, sequences for the T cell receptors uh, encoded in each T cell. But if there's the right complementarity between the T cell receptor and the ligand on the antigen presenting cell, which is um, the peptide MHC complex, then that T cell will become activated and proliferate. Um, and so there's also, I should just say, a great deal of interest in understanding the system of um, 
of, of, of T cells so they can be manipulated in other ways that might be productive uh, for medical applications. So in addition just to fighting foreign antigens in your body, there's been a great deal of interest recently in getting T cells to kill uh, cancer cells. Uh, and I won't go into this in great detail, but there, this is currently the hottest thing in, I would say, in, in, in cancer right now. Um, and there are, are some um, uh, antibodies that have already been commercialized that uh, effectively uh, allow T cells to more productively uh, kill cancer cells. Um, and the, there's been a great clinical success in this, and many companies are now are starting to move into this arena. But uh, even here, if uh, we truly understand how these T cells work and how the signaling system works, uh, we probably could help design uh, better strategies for getting uh, T cells to kill cancer cells. So it is important to really understand um, you know, the fundamental mechanism of the T cell signaling mechanism, uh, even for pragmatic outcomes such as I show you here. So I'm now just going to take you through uh, some really basic players of the T cell signaling uh, pathway. And again, like any signaling pathway, it's a sea of names. Um, but I'm going to try to make this as simple as possible and, and just highlight the main players. So one is uh, the receptor, which I already alluded to, which is the T cell receptor. It actually consists of uh, uh, six polypeptide chains. And uh, this interacts with a uh, molecule, the ligand, which is the MHC on the antigen presenting cell, which presents a peptide uh, in its groove. Uh, and this could be a peptide, again, from, for example, a virus or bacteria or something like that. And if there's the right complementarity um, uh, and a tight binding interaction between the two, then a signaling system gets set into motion where a tyrosine kinase that's a member of the SARC family uh, called LCK phosphorylates the um, uh, specific tyrosine residues on what are called ITAM domains on the intracellular side of uh, the TCR. And a prominent chain I'll describe later uh, is called the zeta chain of the TCR complex. Um, and once these ITAMs are phosphorylated, they become a new binding site for a second kinase, uh, which is called ZAP70. And ZAP70 binds to these phosphotyrosine residues uh, which allows it to become um, activated from an inhibited state. And it then signals uh, to, it can then phosphorylate downstream targets. Uh, a major downstream target that I'll describe later in my talk is an adapter protein called LAT, uh, which has many uh, tyrosine residues on it that can be phosphorylated by ZAP70. And this adapter molecule then recruits many other proteins that I'll describe. But at this point, the signaling system just starts branching off in many different directions. MAP kinase is activated. Calcium is mobilized. Um, PI3 kinase is activated. The actin cytoskeletal is activated. So the signaling system starts branching in many different directions. So the first part of the talk, I, I, I just I want to tackle this first question which is the initial event of uh, T cell receptor phosphorylation. And this is called also T cell uh, receptor triggering. Uh, but it's the key event that um, gets this whole uh, cascade uh, moving in the right direction. And the interesting question here is how does this extracellular binding interaction lead to this cytoplasmic event of phosphorylation of the T cell receptor on the other side of the membrane. So that's the question we'll tackle in the first part of the talk. And then in the second or very end of the talk, I'll, I'll come down to this question, which is how do you move beyond this um, initial phosphorylation reaction to then uh, start triggering um, these downstream uh, signaling events? So. <clears throat> 
Uh, well, I'll use by analogy uh, with dining. Well, you understand kinesin, so you should understand dining. Well, we understand lots of uh, receptor tyrosine uh, kinases, so certainly you understand uh, the T cell receptor. Well, there's a very fundamental difference between uh, the T cell receptor, which is tyrosine phosphorylated, and many of the other receptors that you know about uh, as receptor tyrosine kinases. And the fundamental difference is that these receptor tyrosine kinases, such as the EGF receptor or insulin receptor, have the kinase built in to the polypeptide chain. So there's an extracellular binding domain that interacts with the hormone, and on, on the cytoplasmic side, there's a built-in kinase. And there's a great deal of information known about how hormone binding on the, the outside leads to receptor dimerization and leads to structural changes of this kinase that cause its activation. Now, the interesting thing about the TCR is that it has no kinase of its own. It has these ITAM uh, motifs, which uh, are the phosphotyrosine acceptors. So these are where the tyrosines are, but there's no built-in kinase. So it's completely slave to another kinase that's diffusing around the membrane uh, to phosphorylate these tyrosines. So there's something intrinsically different about this from the other receptor kinases. The other intrinsic difference is that the other um, signaling systems, EGF and insulin, involve a ligand that is secreted by one cell. The ligand or hormone is soluble, and then the soluble ligand interacts with the receptor on the receiving cell. But in the case of the, the TCR, this is a case where both the receptor and the ligand are both bound to plasma membranes, and the two cells have to come in contact for the ligand to be presented to the receptor. So I'll come back to this because I think this is actually a key also point in the mechanism and a difference from these other receptors. Now, the last thing I want to just say by way of introduction is in addition just to a ligand receptor interaction, there is a lot of spatial reorganization of components that happens during uh, T cell receptor signaling. Um, and this has been observed uh, for years uh, by various labs. Um, this is just a paper from our lab, but here we're visualizing uh, on the surface of a T cell, the T cell receptor that's interacting uh, with a ligand, in this case on a, on a planar lipid bilayer. But you can see that the, the T cell receptor gets organized into little clusters uh, which contain uh, dozens or even hundreds of T-cell uh, receptors. Um, and then also they move, as you can see, to the central domain here by actin flow. So um, this is something in the end we need to understand. Why is there this spatial organization? Why do things come together in these big clusters? And again, I'll come back to that at the end of the talk. Now, in terms of uh, ideas of how the T-cell receptor works. The T-cell receptor has been around for decades since Mark Davis described it. Uh, but even, you know, I would say even up to now, there's great debate about how the T-cell receptor works. So this is actually uh, taken from a review uh, just a couple years ago, um, which in fact presented in the review eight models for T-cell receptor signaling, of which I'm going to condense it down to four. <laughs> But just to give you an idea of the flavor of ideas out here, uh, and don't worry about all these little details here. I'll just conceptualize it. One is that there's a conformational change, uh, you know, just like what happens with the EGF receptors, that somehow ligand binding on the outside of the cell changes the conformation of the T cell receptor, for example, such that the um, uh, the ITAM domains now become exposed and accessible to a kinase. So there's some transmembrane conformational change. The other idea, and don't worry again about the details, you can just listen to me, is that, um, that when the ligand interacts with the receptor, uh, there's another protein called a co-receptor that essentially chaperones uh, the kinase, that LCK, to the receptor ligand complex. 
Um, and that co-receptor essentially delivers the kinase to phosphorylate uh, the T cell receptor. Another idea is that this interaction results in the formation of lipid rafts, which are lipid domains in the membrane, and that the TCR and the kinase cohabit these lipid rafts and lead to phosphorylation. And the other, I, well, another idea that's been proposed is what's called the kinetic segregation model, actually uh, by Vandermeer and colleagues, which actually I'm going to favor in the end, this is a prelude. And that is uh, that there's uh, kinases putting on phosphate, their phosphatase is taking it off, and during uh, signaling, um, the phosphatase and the kinase become spatially separated, and the kinase wins in, in the reaction. Now, so these models were all at play, and um, it's been difficult to really sort out one versus the other, uh, in part because during T cell signaling, many things are happening simultaneously, and it's really hard to know what comes first, what comes second, what's essential, what is maybe secondary. Uh, so because of all this, it's really hard to understand what is fundamental and critical for receptor signaling. So uh, John, a very brave uh, postdoc, <laughs> um, took on what I think was an you know, uh, extremely interesting but extremely uh, challenging project from the onset, which was to reconstitute T cell receptor signaling in a non-immune cell and apply the same ideas of reconstitution, that if we can identify the key components that are needed to get uh, ligand-mediated uh, TCR phosphorylation, then we can understand the, you know, the minimal components that are needed for their reaction and begin to manipulate them to uh, really understand the mechanism. So he uh, undertook this not in vitro, but in taking um, a non-immune cell, which is a garden variety kind of human kidney cell that people use normally just for protein expression, and convert that, if you'd like, into an artificial T cell. Not a truly artificial T cell that behaves like a T cell, but one that can recapitulate the early events of T cell receptor signaling. Um, and uh, also for the students or postdocs in the audience, you know, this was um, a project that required a great deal of patience because it involved like step by step introducing components, understanding how they work one by one, and building up a system over a period of like two or two and a half years where you weren't getting any results, but you were just setting up the system. Um, and at the end, however, at the end of the day, there was great reward because suddenly all these experiments, you know, became possible. So, you know, you go from this time when you're not getting any quote unquote results, nothing exciting or publishable, and then suddenly being, uh, you know, kid in a candy store where, you know, you could do all these experiments in very rapid time scale. So this is what John set out to do, and these are all the molecules he had to introduce uh, into this artificial T cell and, you know, uh, artificial antigen presenting cell. So I'll just go through conceptually that there is a set of adhesion molecules between the T cell and the antigen presenting cell that bring the two cells together, so he introduced those molecules. He um, introduced uh, the ligand and the receptor, and even this was quite challenging because the T cell receptor is a complicated um, uh, protein complex made up of um, six different chains, so that uh, w was non-trivial. I should say a lot of these were made by combination of stable cell lines and transient transfection. Uh, using lentivirus, for those of you that are interested. And the other set of molecules are a series of uh, kinases, um, which are involved in positive regulation. And CD45 and a second kinase are involved in negative regulation, i.e. keeping the system quiescent. So I'm basically, I'm not going to show you all the results that led up to this, but just to the final experiment. So this is one of those things, you know, go bypass um, two years of John's life. Um, 
But let me show you the key readout that he used for phosphorylation. Now, we could look at phosphorylation with radioactivity, but a more powerful way is if you can get a visual readout and see the phosphorylation in real time. So as I mentioned, when the TCR gets phosphorylated, this second kinase, ZAP70, binds to these uh, phosphor ITAM domains. And it translocates from the cytoplasm to the plasma membrane. And that is a reaction you can follow by microscopy. So this is uh, just a simple slide to illustrate that of transfecting this artificial T cell uh, with the LCK kinase and the TC TCR and the ZAP70. The ZAP70 is labeled with GAP or a cell without this kinase. And you can see here without the kinase, it's ZAP70 is all over. With the kinase, it's recruited to the rim. So this is going to be our readout. And um, here is uh, the final experiment that John showed um, uh, you know, to demonstrate you could get ligand-specific signaling. So this experiment here is a control <coughs> where uh, the artificial T cell is interacting with the antigen-presenting cell. Here is the ligand, the peptide MHC. It's all over this antigen-presenting cell. And ZAP70 is all throughout the cytoplasm. And that's because the wrong peptide, in this case, was loaded into the MHC molecule. So this peptide MHC complex is not recognized by this particular TCR that was uh, John introduced into this artificial T cell. Now we can introduce the proper peptide that it is known to be recognized by that TCR. And you can see that uh, here now the ligand interacts with the TCR right where the two cells come in contact. And gratifyingly, the ZAP70 gets recruited to these phosphorylated um, uh, TCR right at the interface. So John was able to recapitulate ligand-specific uh, TCR triggering in this system. And just to say, these are what the two cells look like interacting with one another. Um, the, the, the T cell actually kind of wraps around the antigen-presenting cell. It actually looks a lot like uh, images that are taken of a real T cell interacting with the antigen-presenting cell. And, um, the reaction also happens very fast. So this is a movie that John caught when the two cells just come in contact with one another. And the ZAP70 is normally cytosolic. Um, so here's an image of, uh, yeah, here's the T, C T cell. Here's the antigen presenting cell. And when the two cells come in contact, you're going to see the ZAP70, which will appear as a cyan image due to the color overlay. Uh, right when the two cells come in contact. So here they are, there are the two cells, and that's the ZAP70 being recruited to the membrane. So the, the signaling mechanism happening very, very fast. So uh, the exciting things, experiment worked, that's all really good. Uh, but then, you know, the next question is why? Uh, you know, how is it, what is critical for the signaling reaction to happen? And this is the beauty of the system, because now you can take it apart and dissect uh, what's, uh, what is happening and, uh, and the mechanism by which it's happening. Okay, so first thing that was very dramatic is when John looked at the various components of the system uh, and visualized where they were, there was a very dramatic result that when the two cells came in contact, this is where the phosphorylation reaction is occurring. This is the localization of the phosphatase. Uh, it's basically everywhere else except where the TCR is being phosphorylated. Um, the nice thing is um, John can also show that this exclusion of the phosphatase is absolutely critical because an experiment I won't go through in great detail, but he could re-engineer the phosphatase has an extracellular domain and an intracellular domain. He could swap out the extracellular domain and put another extracellular domain that would bind to another protein target on the antigen presenting cell. And that would drive the phosphatase back into this interface. If, it, if he drove it back into the interface, this phosphorylation reaction didn't happen. So it ab this phosphorylation absolutely requires this spatial exclusion of the phosphatase. And that's very consistent uh, with this kinetic segregation model that I described to you earlier. 
But now one can take the question one step farther. OK, we need CD45 exclusion. But what is driving the spatial segregation of the CD45? How, how, is, how does that work? And um, so that's the question. Uh, and now, having built up this complicated system, now John could slowly take it apart. He can deconstruct it and ask, what are the minimal set of components that are needed to drive the spatial segregation of CD45? And the answer to that was gratifyingly uh, simple. And that is, you don't need any of the kinases or other signaling components. S don't need signaling at all. The peptide MHC TCR interaction itself, without any, as I said, any of the associated kinases, is sufficient to drive the spatial segregation of CD45. So what you're seeing here is now these two cells interacting. Um, with the CD45 here and just the uh, TCR and uh, peptide MHC. And um, you can see here, we're not looking at signaling. We're not looking at recruitment of ZAP70. We're just looking that the TCR and peptide MHC interact at the interface and the CD45 is excluded. And, I'll <coughs> uh, and that is something specific to the peptide MHC TCR. If you look at if the cells interact just with these adhesion molecules, the cells come together, um, but the CD45 is not excluded. So what's going on with this? Well, I, I'll give you some hints. I can't say we know the complete answer to this. But um, one thing that a very nice experiment that John did is to look uh, at how the two cell membranes interact when there's TCR peptide MHC interacting across the membranes. And he could use that by putting uh, an M cherry on the cytoplasmic domain of uh, the peptide MHC, a GFP on the cytoplasmic end of the TCR. So you can now image this by microscopy. And if you do that, you get a, a green image, a red image. And if you overlay them, they look like they overlap. But for those of you that uh, know about super resolution, um, you can take a line scan uh, ac across uh, the red and the green image, and you can get a very detailed uh, profile of the fluorescence intensity. And in fact, you can average that across the whole line, and you'll see that these two peaks, if you look at the precise peak of the Gaussian distribution, are slightly shifted from one another by about 30 nanometers which corresponds to like about a 13, if you include where the GFP and the M cherry are, about a 15 nanometer separation between the two plasma membranes. Now, if you look at how far the cells are apart, when there's a control peptide in there, so where the peptide MHC and TCR are interacting, the cells are just interacting with the adhesion molecules, the two membranes are far apart. When you have the TCR and peptide MHC, the membranes are now coming very close together. So let me tell you a provisional model of what we think is happening. Um, and that is we think that the two cell membranes are initially coming together first by interacting with these uh, adhesion molecules. But these membranes are probably not like flat boards. They're probably fluctuating. They're moving by Brownian motion, maybe also through the actin cytoskeleton. And occasionally, some of these fluctuations allow the two membranes to come closer. And if there's a peptide MHC and TCR that interact, the two membranes get trapped, just like flypaper. So normally, the membranes would fluctuate and come back. But now, they've got this sticky flypaper that's sticking these two membranes together. Now, this is unfavorable because it's creating um, bending energy in the membrane here, which is illustrated uh, by this red. Normally, this would like to flatten out again. Um, and this is also a lot of unfavorable energy because we've now created these uh, four points of membrane bending. Uh, so a lower energy state would be to bring these two points of contact together. And that can happen because these things are probably moving laterally in the membrane. 
to create this state here where all of these interacting molecules are now clustered in a point, and now we've gone from multiple points of membrane bending to just two points of membrane bending. And we think this is what is driving the uh, TCR, peptide MHC, and potentially other things that are interacting across the membrane into a cluster. The phosphatase, on the other hand, has this big extracellular domain, which doesn't have a binding partner on the other side. So we think it's basically being squeegeed out of this region where the peptide MHC TCR are interacting. The LCK, on the other hand, doesn't have any extracellular domain. It's just attached by a lipid anchor. And we know uh, that it's not excluded um, by this uh, set of interactions. So this is our working model of how the binding energy of peptide MHC leads to spatial segregation of this kinase and phosphatase. So this suggests a kind of a simple ingredient for this signaling system. Now I'm not going to say that the signaling in a T cell is as simple as this. This might have been the ancestral version on which a lot of bells and whistles have been added. So I don't want to imply this is all that's going on. But that uh, essentially what this system may be using is this binding energy between the receptor and the ligand. I personally don't think there's a conformational change that's going on or that is necessary for this. But what this binding energy is being used to do is to cause se spatial segregation of proteins in the membrane, specifically that of a phosphatase that's a negative factor largely, it's taking away phosphates, uh, that's excluded from this region, and a positive kinase that doesn't feel these exclusion forces, and that gives rise to T cell signaling. Now one thing, if this idea was right, you can then say, okay, well, what's so special about the TCR and peptide MHC? I mean, if what's needed is just to create binding energy across the membranes, maybe that can be replaced by some other form of, you know, a ligand receptor pair that if you attach, uh, you know, the cytoplasmic signaling domains to something else that's creating binding energy across the membrane, maybe you can also get a signaling system. So we've tried this in several cases, um, and it does work. And I'll show you the most recent incarnation, which I think is pretty exciting. And that is to replace the TCR uh, with DNA. So um, in, in this case, this is work by Marcus Taylor, uh, another uh, really wonderful uh, postdoc. who's actually a joint postdoc between my lab and G2 Mayer. And he's got a lot of help from Zev Gardner at UCSF. But the strategy here is to, um, on the T cell, uh, take the normal cytoplasmic domains of the, that get phosphorylated. But on the extracellular side, <clears throat> just put a domain to which you can covalently attach a strand of DNA. And replace the uh, antigen presenting cell with a lipid bilayer and anchor via another protein tag another strand of DNA on to the bilayer. Now, of course, we want to bring, so this is the, like the mimic of the peptide MHC. This is the mimic of the TCR. We now want to bring these two strands of DNA together, <coughs> which uh, Marcus can do by adding a trigger strand that basically forms complementary base, base pair, Watson-Crick base pair stranding, strand interactions between uh, the DNA on the T cell side and the DNA on the bilayer side uh, to bring these two membranes together in this kind of interaction. Now, He's also introduced this not into an artificial kidney cell, but he's introduced this into, well, maybe somewhat like a more T cell, an immortalized T cell that people standardly use uh, in culture, which is called a Jerkat T cell. Um, and the experiment is, if we introduce this DNA system here, uh, so instead of using the normal T cell system, can we replace this just by uh, DNA, basically interacting uh, across these membranes, and will that signal 
downstream in the T cell to the normal signaling system. So two of the outputs that we know are involved in T cell receptor uh, after T cell signaling are actin polymerization and also MAP kinase activation. So um, just in terms of actin activation, let me just show you. This is what a, a T cell receptor looks like after it's been activated. The actin becomes, uh, uh, the cell spreads on the, T cell receptor spreads on the surface uh, because the actin network becomes uh, uh, very active for polymerization. Um, so the question is, do we get this kind of behavior? So I'll show you the experiment now. This is a, a, a T cell receptor. We're actually looking at the DNA receptor tagged with GFP. And now we're adding the trigger strand just now to bring these two membranes together. And you can see the cell now triggering the actin cytoskeleton and beautifully spreading out after uh, these two strands of DNA across the membrane have been brought together by the, uh, this trigger strand of DNA. And you can also see, just like the real T cell receptor, this artificial DNA receptor, if you like, is also becoming uh, organized into clusters very much like the way the normal T cell receptor does during the signaling process as well. And it also activates the MAP kinase pathway. So we can follow that just by measuring uh, phospho ERK um, uh, with an antibody. Uh, and we can measure the number of phospho ERK responsive cells as a function of um, ligand density, so that's the DNA ligand on the artificial bilayer, so we can vary the ligand density and see if uh, these cells now become phospho ERK positive. So you can see you get this um, activation uh, curve where the more ligand you have, the more cells become activated. But the beauty of this system, and the reason why we're going to DNA, is that uh, although this is still early work in progress, is you can manipulate DNA in ways that is much harder to manipulate proteins. So we can control the length of the DNA, the thermodynamics of the DNA-DNA interaction, the off rate of the DNA, just by controlling the oligos that we use. So uh, we can vary and explore the entire space of what is needed in terms of binding energy across the two cells to trigger the signaling system. And you can even see this if we go from a 16 or, or uh, Marcus goes from a 16 mer to a 13 mer, there's good signaling, drops the base pairing down by two nucleotides, and signaling is off. So what we're trying to do is to really understand what the T cell is seeing in terms of a ligand to connect to the signaling system and activate the downstream signaling pathway. And this has been a big debate in the field about what a T cell receptor sees in the peptide MHC to cause it to activate. So we're hoping to understand this in a much more controllable way um, uh, using uh, DNA where we really can control these parameters much better. So in the last part, I'm now going to switch. So I kind of gave you a flavor of trying to reconstitute elements of T cell receptor signaling in a, by making an artificial cell, if you'd like, and even that we can make artificial receptors that can connect even to the normal T cell receptor system. This is going to be a different approach now of making pure proteins, so there's no cell here at all, to reconstitute elements of the T cell receptor signaling system using a completely defined system in vitro. And there are various things that I, I think are interesting to reconstitute. One is, you know, this initial model. Can you bring uh, membranes together and lead to protein exclusion? Uh, can we really understand this network of kinases and phosphatases to understand how they behave? And can we uh, reconstitute elements of downstream signaling? So I'll give you um, a progress report where we are on all of these. This is uh, the least advanced, but just to show you that it's possible that uh, we can take a completely artificial system of a supported lipid bilayer. These are, you know, lipids bought from Sigma, or uh, and a, a vesicle, which is uh, again from defined lipids, a giant unilamellar vesicle, and put the extracellular domain of CD45 on the GUV. So this you can think of, I guess, as the T, T cell. 
and a ligand receptor pair that you can control with a small molecule to bring these two membranes together. And the short answer is if you, you, if you don't have rapamycin, they're all even. But if you bring this pair together with rapamycin, you can see the clustering of the receptor and the ligand and the exclusion of the CD45. Here in a you know, completely biophysically accessible system. So I think this is going to be interesting. Um, in terms of the kinase phosphatase reaction, uh, this is maybe somewhat uh, info UE, uh, probably a, a product of your great graduate program. So thank you very much. Enfu is uh, really uh, just a super fantastic scientist um, uh, now doing a postdoc in my lab. It was from Ed Chapman's lab. And um, he has uh, taken on, I think, a very important project of understanding uh, the entire network of kinases and phosphatases that are leading uh, to the phosphorylation of uh, T cell signaling. So the, this is the cytoplasmic network that's all impinging upon whether phosphate goes on or taken off of the TCR. And in fact, it's quite complicated because uh, there's LCK, which is putting phosphate on, but it has a number of complicated regulatory mechanisms uh, for turning that kinase on or off or changing its activity. Um, there's a negative regulatory kinase that is uh, controlling the activity state of LCK. There's CD45, which is taking phosphates off of here, but it's also removing an inhibitory kinase from LCK. So the bottom line is this network is really easy to draw as a model diagram on your Macintosh, but very hard to understand on first principles about how this network really works uh, when it's all, when it's all uh, combined. So, you know, towards the end of the day of really understanding this whole system in silico, you really need to get good quality data of how these uh, enzymes are behaving and also how they're behaving when they're put in combination, which again, you know, one cannot drive um, a priori. So his approach was to purify all these enzymes and um, put them on the surface of a liposome and then study, develop assays to study the in vitro phosphorylation of the TCR. And he did that by developing a FRET assay where here is the TCR a cytoplasmic chain. Uh, and when it gets phosphorylated, um, it recruits um, a domain of that other kinase that I told you about, ZAP70, so he takes the interacting domain of ZAP70, puts a fluorophore on it, and when this fluorophore is recruited to the TCR, there's a FRET interaction between this uh, tagged uh, reporter and uh, a rhodamine that's present on the liposome membrane. The net result is that your reactions look like this, that um, here is uh, um, the FRET signal that's going on when this reporter comes uh, in contact with the membrane. And here we're activating the kinase by the addition of ATP. So he can both measure the rate of phosphorylation as well as the extent of phosphorylation in the reaction. This is just to show that the, this FRET assay is doing just as good a job as a really laborious uh, blotting assay. Um, so this allows him to really get excellent um, kinetic readouts. And I'll give you um, just a flavor of a few results that he's gotten from this system, although he's gotten an enormous amount of information. This just stresses a lot of people in the field uh, study these kinases in the following way. They take, and this is true in the SARC field as well, they purify SARC. Uh, they study it in solution with a single time point IP, often with an artificial su substrate like enolase or a peptide or something like that. These enzymes are meant to be interacting on a membrane and with a real substrate that has, you know, uh, physical features that are different from a peptide. But this shows the difference in rates in which if you're studying something in solution, versus on a membrane, for example. 
Here is the rate of uh, phosphorylation for uh, LCK and uh, the TCR if both components are in solution. Effectively, hardly any, over this time scale, hardly any reaction occurring. If you increase the amount of kinase by tenfold, you can begin to see something. If you put these components on a liposome membrane where they can find each other on a 2D surface, the rate we estimate is about 700-fold uh, faster uh, than in solution. So I think really for understanding a lot of the enzymology of membrane-bound kinase phosphatase reactions, you really have to study these things uh, on a membrane surface. The other thing, another thing that uh, ENFU try to deconvolute is that LCK, which is this kinase, is actually a really complicated machine. It um, has, uh, it's phosphorylated at C terminus, and this creates like an auto-inhibited state, um, which after this phosphate is removed, goes to some kind of open state, and it can be further enhanced by autophosphorylation at the active site. This is known for SARC, um, but again, a lot of the, first of all, SARC need not necessarily be the same as LCK, and also a lot of this study, if you really go through the literature, is more qualitative than quantitative in terms of the real understanding of what these states are in terms of real um, catalytic effects on LCK. So ENFU uh, basically was able to dissect this by, first of all, creating um, biochemically pure states of LCK where he could knock out one phosphorylation residue uh, by knocking out the tyrosine and then uh, phosphorylating the other residue essentially to completion. Um, so he can create uh, basically the four major different states of LCK uh, and measure the reaction rates. Um, get the KMs, get the KCATs, and all of that. So now he actually has a really detailed a map of the catalytic activity of every single state of LCK, which again I think is going to be critical for mathematical models in the future. But there are also some, this is just a summary, this is on a log scale of the differences in the catalytic rates of these four different regulatory states of LCK. But there are even some really interesting things about this, that the order of phosphorylation, if you start off with like naked LCK, it really matters which phosphate uh, gets phosphorylated first uh, because LCK autophosphorylates itself. So if this negative regulatory phosphorylation residue gets hit first, the kinase activity goes dramatically down. It goes down, well, at least five-fold. And now this uh, relatively inactive LCK has a hard time autophosphorylating itself on this active residue. On the other hand, if you proceed through the cycle in this way, you phosphorylate the active site first. The second phosphorylation of the um, inhibitory tyrosine doesn't really do that much to inhibit the activity. So there's probably an important kinetic effect in this, which I can't say we totally understand, about which tyrosine actually tempor temporally gets phosphorylated first in these reactions. And the last thing I'll tell you about what, what ENFU did was a really detailed understanding of this whole network where he can actually use, um, uh, you know, 96 well plates. And uh, by this FRAT assay, this is the FRAT assay curves that you see all over here, but systematically vary the concentrations of LCK and CD45 or in some experiments, adding additional components in the reaction, and measure the reaction rates as a function of concentration of uh, you know, these opposing um, kinase and phosphatase uh, uh, in the reaction to look at the net effect of phosphorylation. And from this, he's been able to essentially make phase diagrams of the enzymology of what this system looks like um, as a function of different concentrations. And there's a lot of information here, but first of all, I should say this is, uh, blue is uh, low 
reaction rate, so little phosphorylation, red, increasing amounts of red show in increased phosphorylation of the TCR. So that's what you're seeing here. This is kind of thought to be the physiological range of LCK and CD45. You can see it's largely in a quiescent state. So you either have to go down in this direction of decreasing the phosphatase to move into a phosphorylation uh, reaction um, or increase, uh, for example, in this direction, uh, the level of the LCK, which I'll come to in the next slide. But this phase diagram basically tells you when the system is going to be in an on state or when the system is going to be in an off state. And you can measure this, you know, looking at the change of this phase diagram with, uh, for example, if you knock out one of the regulatory mechanisms of LCK, the, act, the negative regulation, the, sh the phase diagram shifts over. Um, basically, it becomes easier to uh, phosphorylate the receptor. Um, and by measuring, for example, the rate of the reaction, uh, keeping one of the components constant, he can uh, measure uh, essentially a concentration-dependent reaction rate of, of how this reaction changes as a function of changing one of the components. And that's what's shown in this system. So out of this, CD45 is held constant. We're looking at the variation in LCK, or here LCK is kept constant, and we're looking at the variation of uh, increasing CD45. So here we're activating it here. It's active at low phosphatase and it's being turned off. But the bottom line is, and what we can measure here is the Hill coefficient. So this is how cooperative the system is. And interestingly, in both cases, we do see some cooperativity in the system as a function of changing the enzyme concentration. But the Hill coefficient is, for a reason we don't completely understand, honestly, is steeper if you're varying the CD45 concentration. So um, if you keep LC LCK constant and you end up decreasing CD45, you get a steeper switch-like behavior to TCR phosphorylation. This is interesting to us because we think this is how, remember what I told you before, we think what's happening in this reaction is we're removing CD45 from the reaction zone where the phosphorylation is occurring which means we're decreasing the CD45 concentration. Um, and so we think this is probably important leading to kind of, when you start segregating out the CD45, you get to a steep transition point where the system is going from an off state to an on state. So it's at least consistent with what we're thinking about. Okay, in the last five minutes, um, I want to talk about this clustering, because these are some cool experiments here. I'll have to rush through this a tiny bit. But remember I said there's a lot of clustering going on in this system. It turns out many years ago, actually, this is our first paper on T cells, uh, Adam Douglas found that this protein called LAT seems to be important for these clusters. This is another uh, marker for these clusters. It's a co-receptor called CD2. But in a LAT-dependent cell, if we transfect, he transfected in LAT, um, normal LAT, he could get these clusters in the, in the mutant cell line. But if you transfected in LAT that didn't have any tyrosines, no clusters. Now, the interesting thing about LAT is it has lots of these phosphorylation groups which bind to SH2, SH3 adapters. And what might be possible is like LAT is an octopus has lots of arms, lots of adapter proteins. These adapter proteins have multiple arms. And you start to get this multivalent system that can lead to clustering. So to test these ideas, you know, ideas one could go to purified proteins. So again, I'm rushing through this a little bit. But uh, as part of a, a collaborative grant that we all got together, um, we brought a number of people, PIs, uh, to the Marine Biological Laboratory at Woods Hole. Uh, and one of the goals for that summer, this was the past summer, was to reconstitute some of these protein-protein interaction systems that are going on in T-cell signaling. This was like a tremendous amount of fun. I think this is how we should do a lot of our science these days. None of the work I'm going to tell you about would have been possible in any of our own labs. Everyone here had different expertise. They brought students or postdocs. 
that had different expertise in different proteins. We all worked cooperatively to bring these proteins together at Woods Hole. So we prepared almost for you know, a period of seven, eight months with ideas and reagents and just went, you know, worked around the clock at Woods Hole to do experiments. And it was just like you could pull stuff out of the freezer and you know, come up with an idea at noon and have it realized at you know, midnight. So it was really fun. And uh, actually, one of the few things, we actually got more work done than we anticipated, which is it's usually, <laughs> usually the opposite. Anyway, these are some of the key people, again, in the project. I'll tell you about John Ditlev is in uh, Mike Rosen's lab. Zhao Lei uh, Su is in my lab. And Enfu also helped with many of these experiments. Other folks helped, too. But the first thing, I said Latin might be an octopus and create clustering. So in this experiment, we took LAT and some of these adapter proteins, phospholat. And this is experiment, uh, OK, the phospholat here is on a bilayer. I thought I had another movie here. But anyway, it's completely diffuse. Uh, but then we add these adapter proteins. And then at the end of the experiment, we're going to add phosphatase. That's going to take the phospho groups off of LAT. And the phospho groups are needed to interact with the adapter. Here's what happens. Boom. You add these adapters. They form these clusters, very similar to what you see in a T cell. You add the phosphatase, they go away. So we really do think that the ability to form these multivalent interactions is creating, actually, a higher order complex of proteins. And the question is, are these involved in signaling? So at the very end of the summer, we took on the ambitious goal of actually trying to reconstitute the entire T cell signaling system all the way from the TCR, which Enfu was an expert at, to this LAT system, which Xiaolei was an expert at with John. And we had other people involved that knew a lot about actin polymerization. And these are all the proteins that had to come together in the reaction. Very impressive number of proteins. Uh, here is the reaction. So maybe I'll, I'll let this movie run. But what we had tags on, that's the actin coming. So all of this is on a, on a membrane bilayer. There's no cell involved. The, the TCR is on the membrane bilayer. The, the um, uh, kinase is on the bilayer. Other proteins that should be in the cytoplasm are just floating around on the glass cover slip. What you're seeing in green is a flash of the ZAP70 recruited to the planar lipid bilayer, which then phosphorylates LAT, which then forms these clusters, which then recruits activators of the uh, actin polymerization system, which involves a string of events uh, that lead to activation of ARP23 and the polymerization of actin filaments, which emerge from these LAT clusters. Um, uh, yeah, so these are just the components. That's the flash of ZAP70 recruitment. After that, uh, we get the, the LAT, grant, uh, LAT clusters forming. And after that, um, with a longer time lag, uh, uh, the actin being formed out of these little clusters. So, uh, you know, we think we can use this system to really understand a lot of the biochemistry. And so these are the folks involved in the work. Uh, John, uh, again, all these folks are amazing. John uh, now has his own lab, Marcus, DNA work, Jale, and John, uh, a lot of the lat clustering, um, uh, Enfu. Uh, thank you, Madison, for sending him to my lab. Uh, a lot of really nice uh, enzymology. And thank you for your attention. I probably could take a couple questions, and I have to run to a bus to get to the airport because my plane was canceled. OK. Yes. Yes, that's a good question. Yes. Yeah. So um, is it just that it's really big? It has this really big extracellular domain, and um, uh, it's just being pushed out sterically. The answer is that's not the total answer. Uh, if we chop down the extracellular domain of CD45 so it's the exact same size as the TCR, it's still excluded. It gets some added benefit by being bigger. You get more exclusion, but you still get a very effective exclusion if it's the same size. The reason why we think that's true is that part of it is just being big and being pushed out of the way. But also, it, if you don't have a binding partner on the other cell, you end up losing a seat at the table. That's what we think. So if you have this zone uh, where these proteins are being clustered, 
and you have a partner on the other cell, you're kept in that zone. If you don't have a binding partner, you occasionally step out just by diffusion, and someone that has a binding partner takes your seat at the table. So uh, we think that proteins that don't have binding partners, that aren't contributing binding energy across the membrane, eventually lose their seat at the table and get excluded from these protein-rich zones that are forming binding interactions between so the cells. Many proteins get excluded. Yes, yes. And, and he's tested that by putting in different, again, he could do that. Uh, and we hope to look at that at the liposome system too, but he's been able to put in you know, various test cases and look at what get ex gets excluded. I mean, we're still, being, we're still trying to understand exactly you know, what that means, but that's an, at least an idea. Yeah. A really interesting question from, from the point of view of practicality is how much avidity are you going to need in order to pay out a distinction between a cancer cell or a cell, a self, a non self? Exactly. Yeah, we don't not, you know. Well, that's what we're, I mean, there are, so obviously a lot of people are looking at this question. I mean, people have looked at agonist, ag antagonist peptides and measure their binding affinity, like with surface plasma on resonance. So that's been an approach. People are also pulling on T cells and antigen presenting cells to look at force dependent uh, binding interactions. Um, our, uh, some people think that on rate is important. Some people think that off rate is important. I don't know the answer to that. Uh, it's a really key question. Uh, so our approach is try to use DNA. Uh, I haven't told you anything yet, but that's like where Marcus is going now. Now that he has a system working, he's hoping to vary. Um, because we can vary and uh, actually measure all of these parameters for DNA, DNA, oligo interactions um, and you know the very well understood thermodynamically that this may be a good system to be able to understand those questions so but we don't have the answers to that yeah yeah No, I mean, again, that would be the reason to go to a GUV system uh, because, you know, the, there are all kinds of experiments. You could vary lipids. You can vary, you know, uh, membrane tension, osmotically, things like that, which you really can't do in cells. I mean, there are a lot of people even like, well, you know, they take cholesterol away or add cholesterol. And, but, you know, there are so many complicated things that go on in those experiments. So I, I think... Uh, again, we'll try to get at that, but I think at least at the first approach, looking at that in a completely defined UV system may be a better way to go. Right. And so, so, I guess a somewhat related question is, uh, so if you want to have very cooperative sort of clustering, presumably you don't want the lipid binding energy to be too small, right? You don't want to have you know, too easy. On the other hand, you probably don't want it to be too large either. So is there any protein that is known to... Well, you know, there are all these classes of proteins, the bar domain proteins, that actually stabilize membrane curvatures. And, you know, of course, in a real cell, too, in addition just to lipids and membranes, there's actin. So actin is like constantly acting on the uh, cell membrane. And we also know that I, I didn't provide any role for actin in anything, although in reality, we know actin is actually very important for T cell signaling. If you add latrunculin, there's no T cell signaling going on. So, um, yeah, so I, I think it's obviously more complicated when I just presented. Um, but, and yeah, so I wouldn't be surprised if actin is also like inputting energy into the system in addition just to the physical properties of the lipids.